Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our last, but certainly not least, speaker for today, Serena Ulibari. She's a speculative fiction writer and editor from the American Southwest. Her solar punk novella, Another Life, was published by Stellaform Press in May 2023. Uh, she edited the Glass and Garden Solar Punk Anthologies and is a story reviewer for Grist's Imagine 2200 Climate Fiction Contest. Find out more about her at serenalibari.com. And take it away, Serena. Let me see if I can share my screen. Hello, everybody. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, avoiding common pitfalls in writing climate fiction. Um, and of course, I'm coming at this from a solar punk lens, but not all of the examples I'm going to give are really specific to solar punk. So I'm using a more uh, general term of, of climate fiction. So first off, who am I? Um, thank you for the introduction, Lindsay. Um, but here's just a little bit more about um, the, what I've done in the solar punk space. Um, I my Solar Punk novella, Another Life, just came out last month from, uh, from Stelliform Press. Um, and then I published a number of Solar Punk short stories, including in anthologies like Solar Flare from uh, Zombies Need Brains, um, which comes out in a couple months. Anyway, Solar Flare anthology and in, also in Solar Punk magazine and various other places. So that's me as a writer. And then as an editor, um, I am one of the story reviewers for Imagine 2200, which is Grist's climate fiction contest. As a story reviewer, it's my job to sort through the uh, hundreds or even uh, up to a thousand submissions that we get. I, haven't sort, I don't sort through the whole thousand myself, but I'm one of the people who sorts through uh, the stories and decides which ones get passed up to the judges. Um, I also run a small press called World Weaver Press, and we published uh, anthologies like the Multispecies Cities uh, Anthology and the Glass and Gardens Anthologies. So um, anyway, I've, I've been deeply entrenched in solar punk for the last five to six years, um, both as an editor and as a writer. Um, and so that's that's who I am. All right. All right. Before we get uh, too deep into this, I want to talk a little bit about the the way I think about climate fiction, uh, what I perceive to be the goals of, of climate writing climate stories. So these are two quotes that are about science fiction more generally, but I think they apply uh, very well to climate fiction. So the first one is from science fiction writer Isaac Asimov, um, who says science fiction writers and readers didn't put a man on the moon all by themselves, but they created a climate of opinion in which the goal of putting a man on the moon became acceptable. So what we're trying to do with climate fiction is something similar. Climate storytelling uh, will not save the world or solve the climate crisis by itself, but we're trying to create a climate of opinion in which the solutions and changes that we need become more acceptable. Um, so, and I've also quoted myself here, um, my, my first and only viral tweet, um, where I said, it's not the job of science fiction writers to provide a step-by-step -step procedural for how we reach a future state. It is our job to tell a compelling story about what it's like to live there, creating a jumping off point for readers to think about those steps for themselves. Um, so my personal approach is that storytellers do not need to be engineers and policymakers. Um, we are creating thought experiments that prompt readers to think more deeply about these issues uh, and generate ideas about them for themselves. Um, so that's why I don't necessarily care if, um, if a fictional solution isn't entirely realistic, um, because if it prompts a reader to say, well, no, that wouldn't work, but what about this? Um, then in my opinion, that's still, that's still a success and that we as writers are still doing our jobs at that point. Okay, so disclaimer, um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of the most common tropes and approaches that I see in the slush piles when I'm going through um, all the Imagine 2200 things, when, all the, when I'm going through all the Glass and Gardens submissions. I've read literally thousands of climate fiction short stories by this point. Um, so I'm talking mostly about what I see in short fiction and mostly what I see in unpublished stories that keep them from becoming published stories. Um, and of course, it is all my opinion. So I picked out some things that are overused um, and problematic, uh, in my opinion. And uh, But I'm also going to give some tips for how these common tropes can be done well. Um, and again, everything I say is my 
is my opinion. It's an educated opinion, but it is my opinion nonetheless. And if you write a story that includes all of these things that I'm going to say not to do, and you get it published, fantastic. Send me a link to it, uh, and I will happily eat my words. Okay, so I've got um, several different categories that I'll go through. Uh, and the first one, I'm talking about how climate change is not the same as nuclear apocalypse. So one thing I see really uh, frequently is climate apocalypse is that just they look exactly like nuclear apocalypses. Um, they, and they usually refer to the climate crisis like it's a singular worldwide event um, and often use wasteland type imagery uh, that's more representative of the aftermath of nuclear war than it is the aftermath of a climate disaster. So just basically, if you can interchange the words climate apocalypse and nuclear apocalypse and nothing really changes about the heart of your story, then it's not truly a story about climate change. It might be a story about the environmental impacts of nuclear fallout, but that's different than writing a story that shows the effects of climate change by itself. So climate change is not one singular event. Uh, it's an ongoing series of events, and it will have different impacts on different settings. So, of course, ecosystem collapse and mass extinction are very real possibilities, um, but these issues are a little more complicated and complex uh, than a singular nuclear-style wipeout. So if you've written a story that kind of looks like this, how do you dig deeper and make it more original and a little more climate fiction, a little more solar punk? So the first thing, of course, is to do your research. Make sure you're actually writing about climate issues and not just recreating and copying what you've seen in other post-apocalyptic fiction. Um, my second piece of advice is to set it in a specific location uh, rather than just kind of a vague wasteland. Set it in a particular place and then do your research to find out what are the likely climate impacts that that specific location is going to face. Um, we don't always have to tell stories on a global scale. Often the stories that dig deep into a specific location resonate a little more strongly with readers, um, especially in a short story. So um, my third piece of advice here is to remember that Mad Max and Lord of the Flies and those style of post-apocalyptic worlds are for the most part of fantasies of middle to upper class white men. They are not representative of all human nature, and they do not accurately represent how everyone would behave under societal collapse. I think that's important to remember because 20th century media was so saturated with these types of image images and with just post, uh, you know, post-apocalyptic imagery and nuclear annihilation that we sometimes forget that these are fanciful representations. So Mad Max is not reality. So think about how could we reorganize our society in a way that doesn't replicate the oppressions of the past, or at least that complicates it and doesn't just do the same thing um, over in a, new, in a new world. So, and the last thing to consider is just, does your story need to have a complete collapse? It is easier to write from a blank slate uh, where the world we no longer know where the yeah the world we the, where yeah it is easier to write from a blank slate where the world we know no longer exists. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, or as one of the presenters earlier today said, it's easier to destroy the future than to build one. So instead of taking the easy path, can you challenge yourself as a writer to imagine a better future that builds from today? What if today is rock bottom? What kind of future can you build from that foundation? So something to consider. So I'm gonna move on from uh, this idea of nuclear apocalypse to uh, techno fix. And so what I mean by the techno fix is one single solution that solves all climate issues worldwide. Um, just like I said before, that climate change is not one singular event. There is no one single solution. Technology might be part of the solution, um, but we need radical social and economic change, as well as better ethics just around the creation of technology if we're going to reach better futures. So even when technology is a solution, technology can also create new problems. 
which often disproportionately affect uh, the workers involved in the technology or, uh, or people of color or indigenous uh, communities. So for example, um, I put wind turbines on this um, uh, to remind myself that uh, one of the worst examples of real life greenwashing, um, there are many, but one of the, one of the ones I find most atrocious um, is the wind farms in Mexico that provide green energy to corporations like Coca-Cola and Walmart and Mitsubishi. Um, so they put up these wind farms in, in Mexico so that they can say, hey, our products are now green. Our products are fueled by these green energy. Um, and these wind farms have had severely negative impacts on the health and well-being of the indigenous communities on whose land they are built. So if technology is a savior for some at the expense of others, it's not a viable solar punk solution. And I see a lot of stories that kind of present one single solution, that's, that's it, that solves everything. And it's always more complicated than that. So I, one example of a, um, a book that handles this trope well, the Technofix trope, um, is Termination Shock by Neil Stevenson. And I'll, I'll put a list of all the books and stories that I'm gonna mention here. I'll put that, that in the Discord afterward. Um, but Termination Shock by Neil Stevenson, I think handles this uh, trope of the techno fix well because it's all about the consequences. Um, the consequences and complications of having a big singular techno fix solution. So another story that I like, uh, that I think handles this trope well, is in my uh, my anthology Glass and Garden Solar Punk Winters um, called The Things That Make It Worth It by Lex T. Lindsay. Um, this is a story about a couple of scientists that are trying to bring snow back to a mountain in Maine. And so it is a techno fix that they end up um, coming up with. But for me, this story works because it's not trying to be a worldwide solution. It's a solution that's tailored to the needs of that specific location. Okay, uh, one subset of the techno fix that I saw quite frequently in the, the first Imagine 2200 um, submission pile is the benevolent AI dictator, um, where we, it's kind of the opposite of this Futurama drawing that I have here. Um, the idea that humans have screwed up too much, we can't figure out how to fix climate change, so we turn all of our decision making over to an algorithm or a sentient AI. Um, who will only do what's best for the world. So um, this is hugely problematic, as, I, as I'm sure most people in this audience um, can understand. It, it absolves human agency and responsibility. Um, and especially because climate change is a human-caused problem, we need human-led solutions. Um, this is also really no different from a magical solution or like a divine intervention. Um, it's not the kind of solution that gives people hope or inspires real world change. Uh, it's essentially giving up. It also has shades of some eco-fascism. Uh, even if the AI does not go rogue and decide kill all humans, um, it's still concentrating power under a single all powerful entity who claims to know the singular way that things must be done. So you might notice a theme here that all three of these that I've talked about, there is no single solution. There is not one thing. Um, solar punk is decentralized and that is baked into its very essence. So anyway, I won't harp on this for very much longer. Let's move on. So domed cities. People love to write about domed cities. I see this so frequently and I included a, the image I included here um, is from the 1950s and I included that partially because it's a cute little image and also to show just how, how old this idea is. Um, you know, that it, it really does go back to the, uh, the early 20th century. So just like the Mad Max style post-apocalyptic imagery comes from the 20th century fear of nuclear apocalypse, domed cities and domes come from the 20th century goal of space colonization, uh, domes on, the Mar on Mars and domes on the moon, things like that. Um, and of course, you know, domes, uh, domes on Earth. So the main, the main problem is just that it's overdone. I see it really frequently when I'm reading for Imagine 2200, I keep a little private dome count of like how many, how many stories have domes. Um, and so 
and, and often these stories tend to have some weaknesses in world building. And something that I think a lot of uh, writers don't fully think through is the fact that domes really represent a fear of the outside world. Um, they're trying to keep something out or keep something in, right? Um, what they're trying to keep out in climate fiction is usually harsh weather. That's why they show up in climate fiction so often. Um, but sometimes they're trying to stay separate from some external society um, or maintain some kind of population control. So domes are the ultimate border. If you're trying to get into the headspace of a post-colonial future, domes are probably not your best choice, at least on a large scale. So if you want to throw in grow domes or biodomes or dome houses, like that's different. I'm good with those. But you arc a dome over an entire city and I start to have a lot of questions about the world building and about the assumptions that underlie it. So one, um, one example that I think uh, is done well is a book called Implanted by Lauren C. Tifo. And people in this book, people have retreated into domed cities uh, to protect themselves from the harsh storms caused by climate change. And now after 100 years or so of living in this kind of world, they're getting ready to emerge from the domes and reclaim the land. Um, so this is an example of this trope that I think she does really well. Um, and I think it works because of that element of leaving the dome um, and the complications that arise from that. Um, and also it's just very complex and it has really thought out world building. So I'm not saying domes can never work. I'm just saying I see them a lot and they need to be thought through. Um, and there are a lot of other ways uh, to show like a contained and protected society in a solar punk world um, that aren't domes. So I haven't seen a whole lot of solar punk stories that utilize arcologies. Um, and when I do see the term arcology, it's usually not used in the same way that Paolo Soleri envisioned it. So archaeologies are kind of like a contained, walkable, uh, multi-use, you know, city. Um, you could also consider like setting your story in a network of buildings that have sky bridges, right, or some kind of uh, underground system. So there's a story called the Riot of the Wind and Sun by Jennifer Lee Rossman, and that's in uh, Glass and Garden Solar Punk Summers. It's set in an underground, it's set underground in an old opal mine. And this functions really well as protection from the harsh sun and the, um, the harsh climate. It also allows for some really fun bioluminescent imagery because they're underground and kind of in the dark. Um, and I am always, always a fan of solar punk settings that take a setting that used to be something exploitative, like a mine or a military base or, um, you know, something like that and repurposing it into something more solar punk, something more cooperative, something more sustainable. So that kind of repurposing is a trope that I never get tired of. <laughs> so there are other ways than domes to kind of portray your society um, in, in kind of a, a smaller protected way. The next type of story that I see frequently in these slush piles is what I call the tour of utopia or the tour of the new society. And we have books like News from Nowhere by William Morris and Ecotopia by uh, Ernest Kallenbach. We have books like that to thank for this trope, really. Um, and that's that's part of the issue with it is just it's a little bit outdated. Uh, and it, it tends to use narrative conventions that were more common uh, during the time those books were written than narrative conventions that we expect from, uh, from modern writing or from modern storytelling. <clears throat> so usually when I see these in the slush pile, they, they kind of just feel like um, world building with puppets, you know, where the characters exist only as a vehicle to explain to the reader how the society works. And because of that, they're often lacking tension or drama that readers look for in modern storytelling. We don't always need conflict per se in stories, but we do need some kind of tension. We do need some kind of uh, some kind of drama. So how do you make this idea work better? Because it is actually a really useful tool to have the you know characters go around the city and learn how things work. 
and you know people that are attracted to solar punk we want to we want to know that we want to know how the society works it can be a useful tool so how do you do it better uh one idea is to make it part of the story rather than the whole story itself one scene not the entire plot okay um second piece of advice focus on the characters even though you're doing all this world building do it through the characters let them be people uh, who exist and live in this world uh, a stranger comes to town is like a classic way to tell a story uh, just make sure that the stranger has a good reason to come to this town and that the people there you know seem like they they already exist and you know and interact in that way so um so like i said we don't always need conflict to tell a compelling story uh, but we do need tension and drama so one way to create that in a story like this is to give your char characters a difficult choice to make give your characters a choice and that instantly creates some kind of tension you can do this in any, any kind of solar punk story any kind of story really um, but often when people are saying, how do you create conflict in, the, in solar punk? It doesn't have to be conflict. Give your characters a choice. Um, another way to create tension in a story like this would be to introduce a disruption from the ordinary. So if they're going around town, but something goes, uh, something goes wrong or something you know, ch is different than what they expect, um, then, then that can transform this from a static tour to a dynamic interaction All right so give your characters a choice give some kind of diversion from the ordinary and then it's an interesting compelling story so one example that i like uh, of this trope is the story called caught root by julia k pat which is again in solar punk summers um there's two, essentially two utopian cities in this story that have that use very different methods for how they've achieved their utopia and a representative from one of these cities visits the other city. Um, so there's already tension and mistrust between these two communities because they have different strategies. Um, and also because the characters in this just feel like messy human beings who make difficult choices. So I think it really works. All right. Um, let me just double check the time here. Okay. So lastly, we have what I call the grandparent story. And um, there's some variations on this too, but this is very, very common. This seems to be where kind of everyone's mind goes when they uh, start, when they decide they're going to write a solar punk story for the first time. This is like the first thought. Um, so this is a story that revolves around a grandparent telling a child um, about the bad old days right? Usually as a vehicle to uh, tell the reader how we got to a better future. Um, so we have some variations like some kind of annual festival where an elder gives a speech to the whole town, right? Or a uh, class assignment where the kid has to learn about the days of petroleum or, you know, something like that. Um, or reading an ancestor's journal, or watching uh, you know, a video blog of an ancestor or you know, holograms. There's all kinds of variations, but they're all kind of the same thing, right? Where we have this dual narrative of the, the better future and the, and the worst past. Um, so this, the problem with this, aside from the fact that it's just very common, um, is that it often has similar issues to the tour of the new society trope. It's often lacking tension and it's more focused on the world building than it is the character. And this time we're just using, we're often just using dialogue, um, you know, especially if it is like the, the grandparent telling uh, the child or, you know, or whatever ancestor telling the, um, the person in the future. Um, we don't even have, I, I called the other one like world building with puppets here. We don't even have puppets. It's just the dialogue. So that, um, that kind of drains tension from, uh, from the story, even if what they're being told is, you know, interesting, is full of good ideas. Uh, it often just doesn't make for a compelling story. So how do you make it work? Because I definitely have read stories where this works quite well. So Again, first, focus on the characters. Um, 
These stories use a kind of dual narrative uh, with the frame story being the person in the future, uh, listen, and then the second story being the story of the past. So make sure that the frame story, the story in, happening in the future is more than just the kid or whoever sitting there listening. Um, flesh out that character, make sure that that character is changed by what they hear. And in the story of the past, make sure that it's a story about a specific character and not just a, a recitation of facts or a summary of future history. So the character in the future and the character in the past are equally important in a story like this. So an example of this trope that I think was done very well is a story called the Se A Seance for the Anthropocene by Abigail Larkin. And this is in Imagine 2200, the first, uh, first collection. Again, I'll link, I'll link to this um, in the Discord afterward because um, you can read it online. It's also in a collection called Afterglow. So anyway, A Seance from the Anthropocene. Uh, in this story, a kid receives a class assignment to learn about the bad old days, and she goes to her mother, to, or her grandmother rather, um, to ask about her grandmother's lived experience at this time. Um, so again, it is, it is you know head on that trope, but this story is beautifully done because it does exactly what um, what I was saying before. The characters are not just puppets; it's not just world building through dialogue. Um, the girl learns something really poignant about the past, and it has an effect on her understanding of her present, our future. Okay, so this, uh, this trope absolutely can be done well. Just know that it's very common um, and that you need to dig a little deeper uh, if that is the story that you're, uh, that you're trying to tell. Okay, some uh, so I don't want anyone to leave this uh, feeling discouraged. Um, any of these ideas that I've talked about, they can work as a story. You just need to dig deeper from your first idea um, and question some of your baseline assumptions. So I hope I've given you a few tools to do that. I know we talked uh, very fast here, but hopefully um, you've gleaned a few tools for how to do that. And so here to summarize, here's a couple of my just general tips for writing climate fiction. Um, so, uh, one, just do your research, consider, uh, and consider including some of the less well-known impacts of climate change, um, nothing wrong with hurricane stories and rising sea level stories, but there are lots of other really interesting, uh, uh ways that climate will change everyday life and, you know, and things that we don't always talk about when we're talking about climate change that can make for really interesting stories. So consider some of the lesser known impacts of climate change um, and what consequences those could have on your characters and on their culture. So um, my second piece of advice for writing climate action is to get out of the 20th century mindset. Um, so many of the things that I talked about today are simply leftovers of 20th century paradigms and 20th century assumptions. So the best way to make that shift from 20th century thinking to 21st century thinking is to read more stories that have been published in the last 20 years, preferably in the last 10 years. Um, so uh, get out of the 20th century mindset. Third is to focus on the characters. The superpower of climate fiction is to bring this big, scary, abstract science of climate, uh, climate change down to the personal level. That is what climate fiction does. That is what it is for. Um, readers connect to characters more than they connect to facts. Don't, ch don't shortchange your characters. And if you're the type of writer who veers toward the very technical and you're not so good at the squishy emotional stuff, Make sure you have beta readers and critique partners who are good at that um, and who can let you know when you fall short on emotional resonance or who can make suggestions about how a character might respond to something on an emotional level. But writing is a cooperative effort. And my last piece of advice is to include hope, always. Even if you are all writing about disaster, even if you are going for a more dystopian angle than a solar punk angle, still include hope. 
there are actual studies that have been done that show that climate stories uh, that don't have hope in them, they just cause re readers to shut down and disengage from climate issues in the real world. Whereas climate stories that include hope, they can inspire real life, uh, real life action, whether that's direct action, voting, donating, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, hope in climate stories can affect real life, uh, real life action. So whether you're writing solar punk or some other flavor of climate fiction, hope is a necessary ingredient. So remember the Asimov quote from the beginning, storytelling cannot save the world on its own, but it does have the power to shift the climate of opinion so that people believe that saving the world is possible. That's what I've got for you. Um, I am hoping that there are some questions that we can address. I'm gonna look at the Q and A. All right, here's, here's a good question that I don't know if I have a good answer to, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the question. Uh, so to get to your techno fix point, when does, uh, when does technology become infeasible when few are impacted? Call me utilitarian if you want, but uh, don't have the needs of the many be weighed against the needs of the few. Or in another way, if a positive technology requires things to be broken, is this technology bad? That's the question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't have a I don't have a solid answer for this, um, but I'm also uh, a writer, not an engineer. So these are the these are just the kinds of questions that we need to ask ourselves when we're thinking about uh, a technology, um, whether whether it's something that already exists. Solarpunk often takes things that already exist and just you know broadcasts it forward into a world where it's uh, something that's that's more mainstream, like it's, it's a technology that's niche now. And we're saying, what if, you know, the whole world ran on this, right? Um, and so we just, as writers have to think through those, um, think through those, those implications. And in terms of like the needs of the many, the needs of the few, I mean, in, in future spaces, there's always going to be people who, uh, whose needs are not met. There's always going to be, you know, someone who's hurt by things, we can't ever, uh, you know, get away from from that. But are they the same people that are being exploited now in these future systems? Right? Is it still the workers? Is it still the indigenous people? Is it still the same people who suffer in our world that are suffering in our fictional world? Why? Can you know? Can you can you think through a way that uh, that just that changes our current paradigm and creates new problems? New problems, that's where stories come from. Does it have to be the same people that are being exploited? Does it have to be the same problems we face today? Because sure, yeah, it's always going to be the needs of the many, the needs of the few. So who are the few? It's just, a, it's a thing to consider. All right, so that's that's the best answer I got for that. Uh, do you see any specific romance tropes that you think are overdone or overrepresented in climate and solar punk fiction? Does love look different in solar punk fiction? Uh, do you see rainbow washing, rainbow washing? Um, interesting. So uh, one thing that I've observed is um, that there's there doesn't tend to be this uh, the same emphasis on like nuclear family. Uh, I see a lot of uh, I see a lot of queer representation in solar punk, which I think is fantastic. Um, I I haven't considered that to be uh, rainbow washing, but I'm gonna I'm gonna consider that term a little more deeply. I'm gonna I'm gonna process that a little bit. Um, but I do uh, I do see a lot of queer representation. I think it's usually done well, and I see a lot of um, uh, polyamorous um, representation as well. Uh, which I think is also good. And it just feeds into, um, you know, the nuclear family is kind of a, uh, uh, it, it's it's kind of a capitalist concept, really. Um, and it's not the way that, that humans have uh, loved and um, existed in households for most of, uh, for most of human history. It is really a fairly modern concept. So, um, so I think in solar punk, uh, stories and solar punk futures, you know, there's, there's a desire to kind of get back to, um, or to, to get away from, maybe not back to the way things used to be, but uh, to get away from that, that concept of the nuclear family or the single monogamous uh, relationship. 
So um, I haven't really seen many romance tropes that I think are overdone. I think um, I haven't really read that much uh, solar punk romance. I, I would I would kind of like to see more of that actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, you know going back to I I, I talked about news from nowhere uh, in the tour of Utopia thing. One thing that I think is really interesting in that is that the central premise is uh, there is no more private property, right? And that is his baseline premise, no more private property, therefore this, 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 this. And one of the things that um, that is an inevitable conclusion or you know, logical extension of that is there's no more marriage, there's no more divorce, because if there's no more private property, women can't be uh, perceived of as property. And so, and there's no need to pass property down to the next heir and things like that. So um, while I don't consider News from Nowhere to be a solar punk uh, story, I think it has a lot of the same kinds of ideas that um, that do feed into solar punk. And, uh, and I just thought of, of that piece of it um, in terms of like what love looks like and what, what romance looks like in the solar punk future, you know, that it, it's... Uh, maybe not so concerned about um, marriage, right? And, and you know, property and heirs and things like that. So anyway, I'll stop rambling about that, but that's a really good, that's a really good, interesting question. Okay, um, I have a fairly quick answer for this one. Have you ever seen climate fiction of any flavor rooted in truly fantasy worlds, uh, not just ones with fantastical elements? Uh, my go-to for that is The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin or the the broken broken worlds trilogy by N.K. Jemisin first the first book is called the the fifth season um and I think that's definitely definitely climate fiction it doesn't take place on earth it's totally in a fantasy world um but it's it's very much engaging with um with climate issues and with um just you know the the earth and and the whole you know ecosystem and everything and in the stone sky which is the third book of that uh trilogy um, she actually has a society, I forget which, what they're called, but she has a society um, that is very much a solar punk style, uh, solar punk aesthetic, solar punk ethos. And it's not like the whole, um, you know, book, but it's, it's one culture that the characters encounter. Um, and I know, I know for a fact that she, she did that on purpose. She was, Nora was aware of solar punk and intentionally like shaped that after, um, after the movement and after the aesthetic. So um, so that's my go-to for uh, for fantasy and climate fiction, um, the fifth season and the other two books um, by N.K. Jemisin. <laughs>